Hey guys, so good to be with you for our next daily devotion. We are in Matthew chapter 12, and we have two unique kind of chunks of scripture today. Kind of difficult to see which one we'll actually kind of park on the most. We'll, we'll do our best to actually hit both. We're gonna have this moment where there's this return of an unclean spirit, and then uh, that's one kind of chunk of scripture for today. And then the second chunk is gonna be Jesus uh, talking to his mother and brothers. Now, in the context of chapter 12, uh, chapter 12 of Matthew, we see Jesus talking uh, that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And this is where um, the Pharisees get real mad because he's doing miracles on the, the Sabbath. He's healed somebody with a withered hand. He's showing himself to be God's chosen servant and the, and the Messiah himself. This is where he talks to the Pharisees about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because they were denying his miracles, attributing it to Satan that Jesus was Satan himself or working through the power of Satan to heal people and to cast demons out of people. And Jesus is kind of, this whole chapter is, is focused on the Pharisees. And then Jesus transitions into that part where it's like, you will know uh, a tree by its fruit. If it's a healthy, good tree, tree it'll pr produce good fruit. If it's a bad tree, it'll produce rotten fruit. And then he's telling the Pharisees, like, you're gonna have a sign. It's gonna be the sign of Jonah. The son of man, three days later, will will rise again. Now, all that's happening, taking place, that's a context real quick of chapter 12. Then this happens in verse 43. It says, when an unclean, this is Jesus speaking, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through the waters, places, seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is gonna be worse than the first. And then Jesus is saying, so it's like, where, where you, is this just a demonic teaching and understanding of what happens when a demon's cast out of somebody? And, and then they eventually re-enter back in because they're not saved. Greater is he who is in you than is in the world. So we know as a Christian, a demon possession cannot happen to a Christian. So um, if a demon gets cast out of an individual, they become a Christian. They're not gonna be able to come back according to other scriptures. So is this just some demonic kind of understanding that Jesus has given us? But here's the context. Remember, we're talking to the Pharisees and here's what he says. So it will be with this evil generation. So Jesus is once again smacked in talking to the religious leaders uh, in context of this chapter and saying, you know, no matter what I do, no matter what good work I do, casting demons out, miracles produced, uh, it is not enough to turn one's heart um, to, to Jesus and to Christ. And so Jesus is having this conversation and he's calling the generation that is literally right there before him an evil generation. Uh, I think Jesus would even look at our generation and could say, this is an evil generation because the plurality of people who are walking in, in wickedness, at least in our own uh, land that we're all familiar with. So Jesus could do all this work, but unless the transformation of the heart is taking place, which we learned a couple of weeks ago that only Christ can do, nothing can happen. Mankind on their own strength or their own ability, their own cognitive reasoning, uh, evidences, just their mental capacity to be able to go, I want to change and I want this heart to change. The only way a, a human heart can change to love God is if God is doing a work in that heart. So that's what we see happening here. And then Jesus is going to switch and he's going to talk about in verse 46, a totally different moment as we're transitioning out now of chapter 12. It says, while he was speaking, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and sister and mother. So obviously we have Jesus here showing his second person in the Trinity here, showing his deity in this sense of anybody who is a believer in Christ, he's saying, that's my family. And that's a great thing for you and I to know as Christians. You know, we all have our biological families, but we also have a spiritual family. And the scriptures are pretty clear that our spiritual family, those that we engage in that have the common denominator of being born again in Christ, we're living out our faith together in community. We have uh, strong biblical leadership uh, leading the charge in the midst of the community. That's the church that Christ has set up. Christ is leading that church, but he has under shepherds leading that. That's our spiritual family, and we should have a tremendous um, love, care, and concern for our spiritual family. I think a lot of times we can over-elevate sometimes even our biological families 
And Jesus said, I'm calling you into the family of God. So both are of importance. Um, and so here we see Jesus doing two things. One, he's identifying that he actually has other brothers. So these are half brothers, which would go against the Catholic Church saying that uh, Mary just stayed pure after the birth of Christ. Obviously this text contradicts that. So we know that Jesus had other brothers and actually other sisters as well. Um, but in context here, it's Jesus is trying to show us that we're a spiritual family together. So I hope uh, this encourages a little bit from the first part of our text for us to show us that um, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, very specific, this evil generation, then he switches it and now we're talking about our spiritual family. And my encouragement to us today as we leave is how important is your spiritual family to you? That place, that community, that body, that church that God has called you to be in, how well are you functioning there and living out your faith in that community? And if it's thriving, praise God. I want you to praise God for your church. If, if Bethel's not your home church, praise God for your, that leadership that you have. Continue to pray for that leadership and their unity within that body. But if you're answering that and go, you know, I am not very well connected. I feel disconnected in the midst of, of my church or my body. This is the greatest opportunity to take a lesson like this and go, how can things change? And I want to encourage you to jump in even more. And maybe that's just a call that could be uh, a call to a pastor, a call to the staff of the church and say, you know what, I wanna get more engaged and more involved in my spiritual family because we see the critical importance of it. It is the environment where God continues to change and move our hearts, which have already been changed by God, but he continues to keep changing. God bless you guys. Look forward to next time.